Hi, Taras Pluskin here, and welcome back to the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. And today we are going to be continuing our little brief exploration into the various different algae and phytoplankton that make up uh, the beginnings of our reef genetics line of live foods. So today we're going to be spotlighting this wonderful and majestic red algae that you see over in back of me. This is unlike our Tetracelmus and our Tisocrises. Uh, this is a species I haven't worked with for more than six years as I didn't use it in the oyster hatcheries I used to work up in uh, back north. But it has been my honor and my privilege to be able to work with this species for the last three and a half years or so here at Top Shelf. Uh, I've been able to get very comfortable cultivating it. Uh, we've been able to successfully, well, raise it up into the reef genetics line. And, and we're very excited to be able to talk a little bit more about the Rhodomonas red algae today and discussing how Rhodomonas is becoming a keystone species for the purposeful aquaculture of long spine urchins and many, many other highly desirable marine ornamentals. So today we're going to be discussing the Rhodomonas red algae. In previous episodes of the series, we briefly discussed how T. Isocrises primarily makes those golden fats, those polyunsaturated fatty acids, really dense energy reserves, wonderful and absolutely necessary for all marine life. In another episode, we discussed the Tetracelmus chui, a little bit more of a workhorse that provides good proteins and starches, but also provides the nuanced nutrition of methylene cholesterols, essentially the building blocks of hormones, things that more cater to long-term and developmental health of various marine organisms. Today, when it comes to the Rhodomonas, it's an algae species that both has good fats and some good cholesterols, but that's not primarily the reason why various aquaculturists and frankly, many, many other biochemical and bioindustrial companies are interested in this genre of phytoplankton. Why? The reason why it's so precious in the true hidden unique gem of Rhodomonas' nutrition lies in that poppy, flashy red color. You can see here being expressed in various levels of density. Uh, in fact, uh, if it weren't for that particular pigment, those red pigments, phycorethrin to be precise, this would be a green algae. It is because of Rhodomonas' and other red microalgae's ability to make this wonderful red pigment that overcomes and dominates the color of all the other green pigments, such as the chlorophylls, that both the Rhodomonas has, such as charismatic, wonderful color, and is also responsible, that phycorethrin, that red pigment, for some of the more profound and more extremely important nutritional contributions it has to the things that eat it and the value that it can have for humanity as a whole. The magic behind Rhodomonas' charismatic red color is the red pigment phycorethrin. This is the same pigment that we discuss in our Dragon's Breath Helaminia macroalgae episode, a pigment which essentially is an anti-oxidizing powerhouse, a living biological fat soluble battery. Why does that matter? What does that mean? The, to be a battery, an antioxidizing agent means that phycorethrin can be used to absorb UV radiation. It can be a sunscreen. To be an antioxidizing agent and a pigment means that you are promote oxygen transport and facilitates enhanced oxygen transport to vital organs and vital subtle cells such as those in the eyes, brain, liver, etc. In the marine environment, phycorethrin is a fat soluble pigment powerhouse, something which is produced by the rhodomonas and then consumed by, let's say, a copepod cell and is not burned off like a fat or a starch for energy. The powers of the pigment phycorethrin are not only apparent when it comes to understanding global marine ecology, but is also becoming the subject of growing interest for biochemical and biopharmaceutical industries, where phycorethrin produced by species such as Rhodomonas and then harvested and concentrated in its pure form are becoming the basis for several unique and powerful technologies, both for human health and for increasing the realms of optics and a great many other technologies. Thus, the true, real, awesome interest when it comes to Rhodomonas is trying to understand how it can actually produce, be the first things in the ecology to produce pigments such as phycorethrin de novo, and thus understanding how that pigment 
transcends and benefits all organisms going from a single cell upwards towards giant charismatic megafauna. But that's out in the wild. Let's talk about Rhodomonas in our home reef aquariums and how it can benefit and make our reefs not only beautiful, but improve the long-term health of the animals that we care so dearly for. So, like I said, Rhodomonas shares some of the great, awesome nutrition that it does from some of the other microalgaes that we have. It has some good polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as T. isochryses, and it produces a lot of good proteins and bioactive starches, such as Tetracelmus chewi. Combined with that incredible red pigment, such as phycoerythrin, as well as other subtle, more nutritional aspects of it, Rhodomonas can be an effective live feed for a great many things related to the reef aquarium environment. Firstly, it can be an extremely powerful live food for trying to grow copepods, rotifers, uh, and all these other live foods that are absolutely beneficial for being able to dose into tanks that have non-photosynthetic corals and tanks that have finicky zooplankton feeders such as mandarin dragonettes. Rhodomonas is so high in nutritional competency that it, like T. isochryses, can even be used to grow the very subtle and finicky uh, Cadillac copepods such as Arcasia tonsa and Parvocalanus crossirostris. Secondly, Rhodomonas can be dosed directly into the reef aquarium where it can be grazed on by corals, triactic clams, sabellid worms, sponges, and a great many other filter feeding organisms that are very difficult to feed on formulated and inert feeds alone. Thirdly, those organisms which cannot consume Rhodomonas directly via filtration and they can't feed on a single celled algae cell will also benefit long term as Rhodomonas cells not only increase short term localized behavior and swarming of copepods and other zooplanktons that they can be actively fed on by NPS corals and the like, but copepods and other members of zooplankton in the reef which consume those Rhodomonas cells will have that phycoerythrin and that nutrition fused within their fats and thus any fish that graze on that zooplankton or corals that graze on that zooplankton will also have that pigment communicated through to them as well. Where Rhodomonas is truly shining at the current moment when it comes to showcasing its novel and potentially profound value to the greater world of aquaculture is being explored in how Rhodomonas is helping to resolve nutritional bottlenecks in the larva culture of species which previously used live feeds and methods are having minimal success with. One extreme example comes from the UK where efforts have been undergone for decades to successfully produce methods to breed European lobsters so that they can be farmed and grown on a mass scale. One of the big issues associated with growing these lobsters is that they exhibit high levels of cannibalism and also have extremely nuanced nutritional requirements. A technique which has been derived with using Rhodomonas is similar to the green water aquaculture we discussed with Tetracelmus chewi, except instead of green, chlorophyte cells, it's been replaced with red Rhodomonas cells, where these tiny lobster larvae are growing in a living soup of Rhodomonas, which also has the pelagic copepod Arcasia tonsa. So the Arcasia copepods are consuming the Rhodomonas, infusing that phycoerythrin and other beneficial nutritional qualities with the fat of that copepod, and then being actively grazed on by the European lobster larvae. Secondly, and far more intimately related to reef keeping, both in the wild and in the reef aquarium, is the application of Rhodomonas in the aquaculture of the long spine urchin, Diadema intellarium. Now, previous experiments to grow the Diadema sea urchin in captivity discovered that this sea urchin has a larval state with a very, very long larval life cycle, upwards of 20 to 40 plus days. And this larva is very particular on the algae which it wants to feed on. Previous successful methods used a fusion of Catoceros beneficial diatoms and T. isochryses with its golden fats, a combination which has worked for a vast majority of growing other larval invertebrate species in the past. However, when it came to growing the long spine urchin, there were a lot of pitfalls and minimal success that came even when feeding these combined microalgae species. That is until a paper came out from the University of Florida 
exploring the application of Rhodomonas microalgae in the feeding of long-spine urchin larvae. Not only did long-spine urchin larvae have greater growth and survival when fed a diet with Catoceros, T. isochryses, and Rhodomonas, but actually exhibited better growth and survival when fed a diet of just Rhodomonas alone. As we reach the end of this video, I'd like to bring up a few tips I have when it comes to both storing the Rhodomonas algae you may purchase from us, and other tips when it comes to having your own home cultures. When it comes to this species, I'm extremely excited for more and more home aquarists and home aquaculturists to be able to work with it, explore different ways of cultivating it, and more importantly, explore different ways of applying it for feeding everything from corals to marine larvae, all the way through to larger filter feeding invertebrates as well. So let's talk about a few general tips when it comes to having success storing Rhodomonas. Well, firstly, something that is in extreme contrast to the species you see above it, Rhodomonas is not from Tahiti. It does not necessarily love temperatures that we would consider warm. I would consider it, in fact, more of a cold water genus as a whole. This obviously having some exceptions, as you can see, my Rhodomonas is growing fine at room temperature. But when storing concentrated biomass of Rhodomonas, it is important even above the Tiso and the Tetracelmus to make sure that it's kept nice and cold the whole way. This algae will tend to spoil at room temperatures quicker than the rest. Now, unlike Tetracelmus, which might not care so much if it gets light or not in the fridge, and uh, not unlike Tiisocrises, which kind of prefers not to have light in the fridge, Rhodomonas needs to have at least some illumination during storage. It has big, heavy cells that become heavy and accumulated with that pigment, and they all tend to sink. So I like to disable the automatic switch on my fridges when it comes to storing my algae. And then, you know, having something somewhat in the bluish spectrum, like a 6500K 6, cool blue light inside the fridge running 24 hours is a way to extremely prolong the shelf life and storage life of this algae species. Now, when it comes to growing your Rhodomonas at home, a lot of people have written to me and had some issues, especially when trying to grow Rhodomonas when they've had success with things such as Tetracelmus, and even when they've had more success growing things such as T. isochryses. So, without giving some of my more nuanced secrets away, I'd like to give some general tips to the average aquarist and aquaculturist that's trying to work with this species and some pitfalls to maybe avoid when first getting this species into cultivation at your facility uh, in comparison to the other two I just discussed. This one's nice and easy. The Rhodomonas is relatively finicky. So again, we're gonna wanna keep it relatively cool. Definitely not higher than 75 degrees. You can get Rhodomona, I mean, Tetracelmus up to 90, and T. isochryses can get very, very hot as well and still be relatively happy. Not so much with the Rhodomonas, we'd like to keep that nice and cool. Also, big, heavy cells. There's a big difference between a, a Rhodomonas cell that's happy and alive and one that's producing the pigment that we want. So two things that we can do to not only keep our Rhodomonas alive, but actually have it grow red. And then over time, as you can see, as that accumulates, it goes from a nice, pale orange gets to a nice rosy red and as we really accumulate we achieve kind of this dark almost blood-like substance. Now that gets nice and heavy uh, so we want to have some relatively heavy aeration going on the culture at all times to make sure that we don't have those cells settling out into suspension having that bottom layer die off and having some problems incur. My last piece of advice when it comes to dealing with Rhodomonas is one um, don't inoculate too heavy go nice and light and be patient. Uh, this is a species that takes quite a bit of time to become comfortable with its giving surroundings. When I received it from a federal lab, it was at a salinity of 1.015. I've since brought up to 1.0263, and in that time, it has been a lot of growing pain. So be patient with this algae, keep it clean, and I very much look forward to hearing what people's results are with it as they have success and start to use it in home aquaculture and dosing their reef tanks. So, to end this whirlwind of various factoids I've spun about Rhodomonas, the red algae, I'd like to end on a few questions. Do any of you dose Rhodomonas into your tank? What has your findings been? Uh, 
Are any of you interested in home aquaculture? Would you consider using Rotomonas as a live feed? Um, have any of you tried to keep a particular sponge or an electric scallop or something in your tank that just didn't live all that long? And something that you might wanna try again, knowing that the reefing, reef aquarium industry is entering a bold new age where you can dose live phytoplankton that producing the initial nutritional seeds of life any given moment. So that's a little discussion about Rotomonas. Love to talk more. Uh, comment below if there's anything else you'd like us to discuss. We'll see you next time.